And glad to be with you today. Uh, this discussion, War and Peace, which I've subtitled A New World Order, but a notice of parentheses, disorder. And perhaps you'll understand that as I get farther on. Those of you who went through at least some of uh, school know that one of the required reading books, at least at one point in, in my own schooling, was War and Peace, which is a a really uh, big one to share, a uh, big one to try to digest through. But interestingly, Leo Tolstoy, a Russian author, uh, chronicles the French invasion of Russia and the impact that it had during the days of the Napoleonic era, the resulting SARS in Russia and everything that preceded really what we know as World War I. It was published back in uh, just before Brother Russell actually started publishing things in the 1870s. But he described in that book the utter disorder and chaos whenever there's a war or battle that plans, the best plans that are made are very seldom followed. And I wanted to include this quote from that book because I think it summarizes really the situation man has when he attempts to exert his own control. Man cannot achieve more than a certain insight into the correlation between the life of the bee and other manifestations of life. And the same is true with regard to the final purpose of historical characters and nations. Brethren, it is very difficult to predict the future. Uh, we know that's true in things like the stock market. Uh, no one can predict that. No one can predict the future direction of the economy, at least with any uh, degree of certainty beyond once. So we have to remember that as we think about things that we read or things that are said, we have to remember uh, that it's very difficult for anyone to be able to predict those things. But this is about war and peace. Between the 16th and the, uh, excuse me, I keep getting these, meeting controls up here. Between the 16th and 18th centuries, war proliferated. Here's just a list. I'm not going to read through all these, but I've got two pages of these. If you look at all the wars that proliferated from the 1500s on the left, you'll see through the mid 1600s. Then you had all the ones uh, beyond that in other areas. Ones you may have heard of, some maybe you never heard of. I'm getting the admission screens up for me, Dale. If you can take that away, it would be really helpful. Here's another list. Yeah. Uh, look at all these. Here's the 1700s uh, and all the wars that were fought. Now, some of you remember like the French and Indian War, Seven Years War, the Russian uh, Ottoman War before World War I back in the 1700s, and then the Jacobite Risings. That lasted for some 60 years, uh, and we know that the Jacobites had many battles. So it's been really a, a big period for man's history of war. The one that we identify most with as Bible students, of course, is World War I, for obvious reasons. It was launched on July 28, 1914, when Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. And then within a week, we saw Russia, we saw Belgium, we saw France, we saw Great Britain and Serbia all lined up against this combination of Austria, Hungary and Germany and World War I had begun. And not many thought it would last very long. Uh, they believed here it was declared, launched in July, so this war is going to be over by Christmas. And we see the troops that lined up within a few months, hundreds of thousands of soldiers died 
in what was extremely heavy fighting. And you see, or he, see here what was called the race to the sea. This was during the September, October period uh, when the allied and counterattacks were going on to control that uh, coastline and be able to bring things in much like you're seeing in today's war where those that are trying to, where uh, Russia is trying to control uh, those places where they could bring in uh, new equipment. The Germany and the Allies were engaged in a really bloody uh, stalemate at that point. The front stretched, as you can see, from the Swiss border all the way to the North Sea. December of 1914, it was Christmas. Well, the trench warfare had become reality of life. Here's a picture you see of the trenches. This is a kind of battle that was being fought in 1914, World War I. The heavy rain that they experienced in Europe at that time was turning all the trenches into real mud holes, as you see here on the bottom picture. Now, today we have people thousands of miles away that are fighting each other. In those days, the Germans and the Allies were separated by only 50 yards. Think about that. If you picture a football field, half the size of the football field, there's your enemy on the other side. And all those that proclaimed uh, an early end to the war by Christmas, well, that dimmed pretty quickly because of the horrors of war that were situated there. Pope Benedict the 15th, a Pope at the time issued an appeal. Could we have a holiday truce? His statement said guns may fall silent at least upon the night the angels sang. And of course there was hope. Well, maybe the Pope can get this lasting peace that we're looking for that would happen by Christmas. Of course, human nature being what it was and the unpredictability of war uh, figured differently and I've inserted in their Bible chronology because we know the importance of 1914 and that date with the war breaking out. So on Christmas 1914, hopes were dimming for any early resolution to this war. The rain gave way to frost. You can see the frost on the fields here of Flanders, snow all over the, those fields and trying to motivate the troops, the German Emperor William II sent Christmas trees to the German soldiers who were on the front. On two nights before Christmas, they began putting up these trees outside their trenches. And on Christmas Eve, they began to sing, of course, Stiele Nacht, in German, Silent Night. And we had what was called then the Christmas Truce. Some of you may have read about this, but the Christmas truce uh, came as the British troops responded to the singing, as they did many Germans. Now, those Germans, Saxons, they had actually worked in Britain before the war, so many of them spoke English, and they started this dialogue between the two between the troops. On Christmas Day, the British and the German soldiers actually met in this 50 yards of no man's land that was between the two places. And as a result, uh, they exchanged gifts, they took photographs, some played football in impromptu games of football. Uh, but it might be fun, fun, I use that term lightly, to think about what it would have been like if you were a soldier in that situation. Jenkins, I'm clean. No.
Ein Blitzer kommt! Ein Blitzer kommt! Jim? Jim, go, go, do it! Halt! Er ist nicht bewaffnet! Nein, Otto! My name is Jim. My name is Otto. Pleased to meet you, Otto. Freut mich. Rose, she's called. Um, it's schön. Um, it's schön. Brethren, many of those that met that day and between those trenches uh, buried their casualties. They repaired the trenches, the dugouts, but after Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, they dwindled out. Uh, no one was meeting anymore. The truth, strangely, was not observed anywhere else along the Western Front. Fighting continued, and even on Christmas Day, there were casualties. But when you think about those men as individuals, we see the problem with war. Some officers on the German side, uh, and one was a man named Adolf Hitler, uh, complained about this Christmas truce and said, have you no German sense of honor? They weren't happy and worried that it would undermine that fighting spirit. But we know the war would go on for four more years. There'd be 20 million deaths, there'd be 21 million casualties, and then the 1918 Spanish flu hit. Brethren, since the recording began around 3600 BC, there have been over 14,500 major wars. Think about it, four billion people have been killed as part of that war. We know many of them casualties of the war. Not too long ago, that was the total number of people that were on the earth. Over the past 3,400 years, humans have seen and been entirely in peace for only about 268 of those. That's just 8% of recorded history. Man has not been fighting his fellow man somewhere on earth. But is there a bright light? Well, in 2010, a book published called Dangerous Times, question mark, talked about peace. 2010, if this was published, saying that over the last two plus decades, those 20 years, that warfare had been disappearing from the planet. That recent decades were indeed much more peaceful than average and saying, some said that means society is getting more peaceful consistent with the decline in war over the past two centuries. Was it? Yes. Look at 1950 to 2007. There were 148,000 annual battlefield deaths. Well, that declined in the four-year period, 2008-2012, to just 28,000 per year. Deaths from the war-related uh, war -related violence, 21st century, it's 55,000 per year. That's just half the number that was there in the 1990s 
one third of the number in the Cold War and one hundredth of what happened in World War II. And these numbers do exclude for population growth. So following the Cold War, yeah, we know that powers changed. The US grew weaker, uh, failures in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Russia and China suddenly came to life and emerged in this kind of silent partnership to try to rule the economic world. Europe began to rebuild after World War II and after the influx of immigrants, Europe began to rebuild their militaries. Uh, if you look, uh, let me get, this chart shows the battle death rate in state-based conflicts. This is between the years 1946 and 2013. So you can see, if you look here, uh, how much that declined. And if you looked at this chart, yes, you would say uh, that certainly this has declined over the years. Political scientist Tanisha Fazal wrote a book in 2007 called uh, State Death. Again, you can see subheadled what's the, the politics behind occupation and uh, behind conquest, said improved medicine and health certainly meant that there had been a decline in battle deaths, but maybe not necessarily because of the violence, but the fact that those wounded soldiers are more likely to survive. Steven Pinker wrote a book back in 2011 called The Better Angels of Our Nature, and in it he analyzed why violence has declined. He said, today, we may be living in the most peaceable era in our species existence. 800 pages of this book, so I don't recommend you read it on a weekend. But he makes an argument with numbers and statistics and figures and references to many, many books, many articles. And part of that uh, is establishing a global peace index. And this global peace index ranks nations according to their level of peacefulness. Uh, 23 indicators, 162 independent states, covers almost 100% of the population, and it gauges global peace on three ideas, the level of safety and security, the extent of domestic and international conflict, and how much militarization exists in the world. And you can see here, we've seen in 2021, they gauge 87 improvements, 73 deteriorations, countries that were less peaceful in 2021. So saying, well, we're making progress. From 20 to 21, we had just a slight change. So is it the end of war? In a book called Only the Dead, written in 2019, uh, political scientist Bear Bromoller uh, suggested that, oh, okay, the past few decades have indeed been more peaceful, but maybe it's just a result of random variation. Uh, maybe it's not necessarily a change in the probability of a war occurring. Well, then came along Aaron Clausett, a uh, very interesting person, young man, but he is a PhD in computer science. You can see all of his credentials. But his work was covered by many magazines on both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, and his work uh, suggested in 2018, he wrote a paper called Trends and Fluctuations in the Severity of Interstate Wars. And this was published in a magazine called Science Advances. He set out to assess, is there evidence of a changing probability that we may have interstate wars, what is referred to as the long peace, or maybe is it just random chance? His conclusion, there's insufficient evidence to say that there's any kind of a meaningful decline in man's tendency to war. His conclusion based on uh, statistical analysis, we would need another 100 to 150 years without a major interstate war before we could conclude that large wars are becoming a thing of the past. 
Well, it only took three years to prove Clausewitz right. Russia's invasion of Ukraine certainly marks the end of what was called the long peace. Prior to this time, you know, it was proxy contests. If you wanted to fight wars, you did it through another way, uh, another person or another group. And we're seeing that today, it's, it's a world war. The decline of major conflict. Also during that period of time, that was where we got decades of prosperity, but that future has now been put in doubt. But the last half century, and the numbers that I showed you, it wasn't just this reduction in casualties of war. We saw expansion in human prosperity, in human health, in human wealth, in human education. But now, as some would describe, the world is entering perhaps the most dangerous period since the USSR collapsed and perhaps since the 1930s. Or brother, my intent is not to scare. My intent is to show that man cannot resolve those problems just as Leo Toy Tolstoy said. You know, as long as this kind of situation goes on, man continues to fight. We know what's happened with the war in uh, Ukraine. Vladimir Putin hired the Wagner Group. Now, you may not have seen the Wagner Group, but that group is a group of former soldiers who are mercenaries, just like you see in movies. Uh, they were responsible for some of the massacres in Bukha. But it allows, when someone does that, it allows plausible deniability. Remember Mission Impossible? You know, it, it, you know, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of your mission. Well, that's what it allows. When you fight proxy wars through third parties, that's what happens. It, it, it allows you to circumvent international laws that prohibit savagery. Now, that group, uh, just a few members that you see here, was used in Syria, Libya, Central African Republic, and Mali. So it's a serious situation. Then President Biden, US President Biden, caused a stir when he addressed the business roundtable and alerted to a coming new world order in the wake of the Ukraine crisis. That, those comments came not too long after uh, conspiracy theorists pounced this offhand remark uh, a Ukrainian member of parliament made when he said, we not only fight for Ukraine, we fight for this new world order for the democratic countries. And everything casts then narratives, social media casts Ukraine as this pawn scheme by a giant cabal. But I hope I've showed you that these random events and the way man fights, this is not anything other than man's inhumanity to man unlike what we saw in that video. 2021, Henry Kissinger commented before this invasion on what happens after we exit the issues of the last two years. The founding legend of a modern government is a walled city protected by powerful rulers, sometimes despotic, other times benevolent, yet always strong enough to protect the people from an external enemy. As the world emerges from the current crisis, it will require restraint on all sides in diplomacy. Failure could set the world on fire. Rather, the world, in some ways, has been set on fire. Peace amongst men today is only an aspirational goal. Now, we all know the famous words from the Miss America pageants. What is your vision for the future? And I'm for world peace. But yet we see, continue to see these conflicts that go on between nations, between races, between ethnic groups, religious wars, age wars, economic groups, neighbors, family members, and yes, even political parties. We see peace treaties. We see peace conferences. It reminds you, has to remind you of Jeremiah 614. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. But Jeremiah's context was not this context, but it is a cry that we hear 
peace, peace. There is no peace. Fortunately, we do have promises for peace, brethren. Psalm 46, 8 and 9. Come, behold the works of Jehovah. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariots in fire. This tendency of man to fight with each other, despite the best intentions on an individual level, will continue until the Lord intervenes, and he's the one that will make wars to cease. Only God can eliminate war and bring peace. And that peace only comes through Christ's kingdom of righteousness. We read in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David, over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Jesus Mountain, his kingdom, will bring a lasting peace, a kingdom more powerful than has ever been known. We see the throes today as it begins to uh, prepare for the establishment of that kingdom. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. It shall be lifted above the hills. People shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that he may walk in his paths. Out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Brethren, these are familiar scriptures. But as we look at the world and what has happened and the constant activities against one another, we should remember that it's that kingdom of peace, that mountain of the Lord set up that will truly bring peace to all men. And it's only then, only then that hostility will indeed cease when that prediction of 150 years or so uh, it will come. Verse 3 of that scripture says, He shall judge between many peoples. He shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. With Jesus' birth, we began the road to redemption. Jesus' birth, he never really asked us to remember his birth. It was really the road that he took to the cross. Jesus said, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. That redemption, that ransom had to come through Jesus giving his flesh. And what did that mean? It would grant opportunity for every person who has ever lived to know true peace and to know a life without war and without end. During this last couple of years, you know, we've had a chance in so many studies to really get into the really heart of truth and to look at prophecy, to look at all other points of truth. And to really examine them, I often wonder if the Lord doesn't, hasn't allowed this time. I know groups have been reading all the works, Pastor Russell, and now reading the Bible. We're getting an understanding from those that probably wasn't there before we went through all the things of the last couple of years. There is one overriding principle of all truth that I hope we can appreciate. The ransom provides an opportunity for all who have ever lived to obtain and to maintain eternal life. 
Everything else is a detail, not an unimportant detail, but everything else is a detail. Jesus gave his life as an equivalent for Adam. And the work now to be done is to remove the effects of sin and to make humans acceptable. Brother, and that's what you and I are striving to be part of. Paul writes in Ephesians 1.10, his goal was to carry out his plan when the right time came that all things in heaven and on earth would be joined together in Christ as the head. There will be one last war, we do know, but that's Jehovah's war. It's in that war that he will reveal himself finally to mankind. Zechariah 14.3 says, Then shall Jehovah go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And Jehovah shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall he be one and his name one. That battle that would take place in Israel. Isaiah 19.22 puts it this way. Jehovah will smite Egypt, smiting and healing, and they shall return unto Jehovah, and he will be entreated of them and will heal them. Isaiah, throughout his prophecies, uses Egypt to picture the nations. Notice that in Isaiah 19. On that day, it appears six times in Isaiah 19. There was never any nation as oppressive to Israel as Egypt was when they had them in bondage. No nation has ever followed God. Uh, even Israel faltered. But God makes himself known. He will make himself known by the shaking, the smiting, but then the healing of the nations. And that iron rule period that we know is prophesied in Revelation brings the nations to their knees in order to respect and get their attention. It's like the old adage and the old joke you heard about the guy that couldn't get the mule to move and the guy that sold it to him took a big two by four and hit him in the behind. And he said, first, you got to get his attention. Brethren, the Lord must get the world's attention. And so Isaiah 19, 22 continues. Jehovah will smite Egypt, smiting and healing. And they shall return on Jehovah. And he will be entreated of them and will heal them. So then the centuries of hate, centuries of conflict, centuries of corruption will gradually disappear. Isaiah 26, 8 and 9 reads, Yes, in the way of thy judgments, O Jehovah, have we waited for thee. To thy name, even to thy memorial name, is the desire of our soul. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yes, with my spirit within me will I seek thee earnestly. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Brethren, the world cannot learn righteousness until those judgments set things right and we eliminate man's tendency to fight one another. Ephesians 2, 10 and 11, Paul writes, in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things on earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, things in heaven, we understand. Things in heaven certainly would bow to Jehovah. Things on earth, we've read here, certainly things on earth will eventually bow to the Lord when he reveals himself to them. But notice the third element, things under the earth. Well, my contention is things under the earth must refer to those that are dead and buried. The resurrection will bring others up to learn and to bow to the Lord in thanksgiving. The resurrection of all dead is the greatest promise we have in the Bible. Jesus said in John 5, 28 and 29, Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in which all that are in their tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto a resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto a resurrection of judgment. But the judgment is only for the purpose of straightening them out. Because Isaiah goes on to say in his prophecy, 
A highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for them. The wayfaring men, yes, fools, shall not stray away. Brethren, I think this scripture is saying that it, it's not going to be extremely difficult for people. They will be able to catch the way and see the way of holiness and be glad for it. And the bulk of mankind will respond. So now Jesus must seek those who want more than just the current pleasures of earth. When Jesus called his disciples, he called Peter and Andrew here, Matthew 4, but I think they were already his disciples uh, when we read in John 1, when they said they had found the Messiah. But he saith to them here, come ye after me, and I will make you fishers of men. He was calling them to action. Now it was time that Jesus would start the bulk of his ministry, his outreach ministry, to bring that gospel message to others. So, brethren, to us, there were many years intervened when few were called. But we know at this end of the age, the call has gone out to those seeking a higher way of life than what they can experience here. A dedication to his cause that would take us above all earthly distractions. But Jesus didn't just call. He set a standard by his own example. When he came to the house uh, of publicans, he sat down with them and even the scribes and Pharisees. But he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Brethren, we are all sinners. We are not righteous. Those who think they are, are not for Jesus calling. We must recognize our own shortcomings. We must recognize and be willing to submit to God's will in order to be a true follower of Jesus. That spirit of sacrifice and an unbounded and unwavering faith, both are essential. Remember when Jesus encountered the centurion in Matthew 8, who came and asked him to heal his servant? And Jesus said, yeah, come show me the way. He said, don't come to my house. I'm not worthy that you should enter. Just say the word. And I know it will be done. When Jesus heard it, he says he marveled and said to them that followed, Truly I stand to you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. What did he mean? A faith, brethren, that is based not on seeing, but on seeing the invisible. He knew that Jesus had that power. Brethren, we don't see always the things that are happening. But we must maintain that same spirit of faith and sacrifice, as Jesus said in Luke 9, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Can you have complete trust in Jesus? It's really difficult sometimes when we go through really hard and difficult tests. Are you willing to put that cause of Jesus above everything else in your life. If we do that, brethren, well, peace can be real amidst all the difficulties and troubles that we see going on around us. We can have peace, but not the kind of peace that's worldwide. It's a peace that Jesus says, I leave with you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. In other words, it's not the world peace, but it's the peace of God and the peace from Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So we should not fear as we see these things. Jesus said in Luke 21 that men would faint with fear at the things in the world. And that's exactly what we see going on today. Since World War I, the entire fabric of society has continuously been weakened. So can you reflect that peace in an unpeaceful world? And I should say, how can you reflect that in an unpeaceful world? Let's look at an example. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, some of you have been to, to Israel and you saw this fountain that's at Jericho. 
and the story of Jericho uh, and Elisha, the prophet, curing undrinkable water at Jericho. That's recorded for us in 2 Kings 2, 19 to 22. Men of the city said to Elisha, behold, we pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord seeth, but the water is bad and the land miscarries. And he said, bring me a new cruise. And he put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of waters and cast the salt therein. And he said, thus saith Jehovah, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or miscarrying. So the waters were healed unto this day. Brother, that illustrates how God will bring purification to a corrupt world. Christ's kingdom, Jesus, the glorified body that is with him, and channeled through the resurrected leaders of mankind, the Davids, the Abrahams, the ancient worthies, they will bring salt. They will bring salt to cleanse a world of corruption, error, sin, just as casting that salt on the water did for Jericho. It was a beautiful city, but it was worthless because of the corruption of the water. Then true peace will come to all. There's no desire God has to destroy the earth, only the current way of things. But Jesus said something more to us, something that applies now. He said, you are the salt of the earth. And he said, you are the light of the world. And those two things, he said, so let your light shine so before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Brethren, we must be an antiseptic now to those who are troubled by bringing them a message of hope. We must be an LCD light bulb in a very, very dark world. If you've ever sprinkled salt on tainted meat, it doesn't make it good, but it does deter the composition, decomposition of that meat. And it kind of masks the effect, the smell of corruption. That's what our presence should do today, brethren. Our presence on earth should arrest the evil effects of how we, by how we live, how we practice our faith. The light, our words and actions, should allow others a respite to escape the parable of life that Jesus talks about in Matthew 13, 13. Seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Brethren, we have been given a privilege of understanding and having an insight into the future that no prophet on earth today or any uh, predictor can generate. It is important to realize it's not our purpose now to cure the world of sin. We cannot do it. But our message can combat the effects of sin and make some sense of its purpose. This statue, when I showed you the video, is in uh, Messines, France, sculpted by Andrew Edwards. It celebrates that Christmas truce. And I would ask you now, are you practicing in this difficult time, peace on earth? Paul says in Hebrews, practice, pursue peace with all. And he says in Romans 12, if it is possible as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And in 1 Thessalonians, he says, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. It is true in that second part, Paul says, as far as it depends on you. But notice where Paul puts the responsibility. Responsibility is on us. It's not on the person on the other side. So you need to ask yourself, and we need to ask ourselves from our perspective, from your perspective, have you done everything you can to rest the situation? Brethren, in our life, let's be the facilitator of peace, not the contributor to unrest. Take this pledge, Lord, may I never be the reason for an unpeaceful relationship with another person. This uh, quote comes from reprint 1840. 
According to the scriptural standard, the elect church of Christ should be the most polished, the most refined, the most polite, the most generous, the most kind of all the people in the world. It should be all these in the most absolute sense, not in the mere sense of an outward form and appearance of kindness, gentleness, etc. so common in the world, but a gentleness, a kindness proceeding from the heart, proceeding from an appreciation of the Lord's spirit. Few today recognize the true significance of both Jesus' birth and his death. But I hope we've demonstrated here and reminding you that the majority will learn when Jesus takes up with his church that millennial reign to deal with death and the effects of sin. That's the final vision of the Bible after all. Revelation 21, 1 to 4. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven, the first earth are passed away. The sea is no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. C.S. Lewis, who I think was truly trying to follow a Christian way, said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Brethren, were you made for another world? Peace on earth, it's coming soon. These are the banners that the Don put up over Christmas time. We had them here in the Phoenix area. Peace on earth coming soon. Brethren, can we wait for it? We can bring an element of peace now, but we know Jehovah will at some point bring peace that will be lasting and forever to every person that has ever lived. Mm -hmm.